Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. As you can see, this time we're looking at an Archimedes A440 uh, slash 1. It's supposed to be a slash 4, actually. It's a slash 4 in the advert, so uh, yeah, I'll check that. Maybe it's got 4 meg on there. Uh, I'm not sure. I hope it has. So I'll talk a little bit more about the Archimedes as we work through this video. I'll just show you the keyboard. Yeah, so the keyboard has seen better days. You know, it needs a bit of a clean up, and it's huge. This system is a lot bigger than I thought it was. It goes back quite a long way, um, and it's quite weighty. Ugh, it weighs a ton. So there are quite a few different Archimedes machines, actually. The 440 is probably somewhere in the bottom to middle end of the range. You know, following this, there were the sort of home versions, you know, the ones that look like, like a 3010 and a 3020, I think, that look like uh, an A1200 sort of thing. You know, it's quite wide, it's got nice green function keys. Those are quite nice and they're quite desirable and those have got the ARM 250 um, processor which I think runs at, is it 12 megahertz? I think it is. The uh, one inside this runs at 8 megahertz as far as I understand. Um, and this is just an ARM 2, I think this has got an ARM 2 CPU. So after the 440 you had uh, things like the, uh, the R140 um, that had the same amount of RAM and CPU, I think. Uh, it was classed as a RISC IX workstation. You had the, the 540, the 225, the 260, those were all ARM3, I think. Uh, and then the 5000, the A4, then the 3010, 3020 came along. You know, the ones I mentioned a minute or two back. Um, and those used the ARM250 processor, actually. The 3010 had 1 meg, the 3020 had 2 meg of RAM and an IDE disk, something like 80 meg or something, I can't quite remember now. And then the final one, I think, was the A4000. And now the 4000, I'm quite um, familiar with the internals of because I fixed, oh, a good half dozen uh, back in the day. Um, they came in with a variety of faults. The most common fault, actually, was the keyboard failed and I believe there was a, a fuse, an ICP on the, the motherboard there and people would plug the keyboard in and it would blow the fuse you know if they did it while it was on that's uh, another good reason not to plug things in while things are powered on um, and the other common thing with those was the, the had, I think Connor IDE hard disks I think in that last model there the 4000 and those used to fail a fair bit as well actually they were good drives those Connor drives I really like those drives they got really good performance out of them but uh, like I say in certain systems they seem to be unreliable and the uh, A4000 was one of them so got a three and a half inch double density drive there 880k I think or 800k it'll uh, accommodate so very similar to the Amiga in terms of the uh, capacity there and round the back you've got uh, some uh, bays here that can be removed I think to accommodate uh, modules, the, the podules or whatever they're called on the back there you know so you can have uh, expansions and things you know that come out the back here. You can see it's got a sticker fitted here, Econet not fitted so like on the BBC this was an optional thing you know you can decide whether you want the uh, Econet connection there or not. Uh, so there's two high um, definition, well not really high definition, high res um, connections here. I think the monochrome, so I've got no idea exactly what format or whatever you would need, you know, you could probably connect that up to uh, some sort of professional monitor or something and it would work, but yeah, I'm not familiar with the standard there. And then you've got analog RGB and that just outputs, uh, you know, your standard sort of RGB levels that would work with most monitors, I think. Uh, serial port, headphones, 32 ohm impedance, marking on that, parallel printer port, and on the right hand side here obviously you've got your mains in and a pass through to the monitor and obviously your main switch. So the Archimedes range um, followed the BBC actually, you know they were manufactured by Acorn computers. They um, contain an ARM processor, the ARM standing for Acorn Risk Machine uh, I think. Um, and again I'll expand on some of this stuff later on, I'll talk a little bit about RISC versus CISC and the ARM processor in general. Um, one of the things we need to get going here is a video cable. Now I can power this thing on, I'm told it's got a hard disk fault, but obviously I can't see anything. Um, now the video connector on the back of the Archimedes here is uh, 9 pinned in, which I'll show you in a sec. It's uh, female, so uh, I've got these uh, connectors here, and it's the same on the t my 1084, my Commodore 1084S monitor. Because that monitor should work with this, I'm told it's the same, if not identical to a model that Acorn used with the Archimedes machines. So um, yeah, I think that this should work. 
I've also ordered a SCART cable. Now I don't know whether that's going to work or not. It's all about the frequencies and stuff here. Uh, you know, the resolution. Is it going to be able to accommodate it or not? I'm not sure. It might do for low res and stuff. You know, if you're in a lower resolution, but like the interlace mode, 512. Uh, scan lines there. It might not, I don't know whether my TV will handle it. It'll just be interesting to see. If I can use it on the TV, fantastic. Um, if not, I've got the 1084S and I could use that with it without an issue. So, as I say, I've got one of these connectors for the monitor, one for the Archimedes, and I've got the uh, service manual print out here so you can see. If you look at this, it says you've got red, green, blue, C sync. Now, I do know from some prior research I've done that there is on some of these the green is merged uh, there's a sync merged with the green it's like sync on green or something now i don't see any reference to that here from the service manual for this particular your model the 400 so uh, i'm not sure whether we're going to need to do a mod there but apparently you can you know cut a connection on the motherboard there to remove the sync from the green signal if that's there what we'd expect to see is uh, a color problem actually you know so you'll see, see the display but it'll be a i don't know what tinge it'll like either be lacking the green or i don't even know whether the green will be super strong as a result of that sync signal or what um but we'll find out so yeah just to reiterate you've got red green blue c sync and then ground that's all we need five connections and if we look at the 1084s uh pin out here we've got ground ground red green blue composite sync now i did a mod to mine because mine would not accept composite sync the pin was actually disabled on the socket some links and things had never been installed as if mine was only ever designed to work with the h and v but i put a little pcb in there uh, i covered in a, i think it was part four of the repair series on my 1084 s monitor there to uh, take the composite sync input and split it to h and v internally inside the monitor so yeah it should work hopefully um, everything there is pretty standard, you know, 0.7 volt peak to peak, 75 ohms uh, sync, 0.3 volt peak to peak. So yeah, it's kind of standard stuff. I would expect, hopefully, it should work, you know, and again, like I say, that matches what you've got here. Yeah, I think the sync will be okay, because the Archimedes is saying they're not less than 0.2 volts sync low, above 0.3 volts sync high, so I think it should be okay. So we'll start with the Archimedes end. You're not going to be able to see this because it's super small, but indented on the plastic here, I can see one, two, three from right to left there on the top. So that corresponds with what we see here on the diagram. So I can just wire it the same way. That's super easy. Um, the wire I've got here, this is uh, a load of wire I ordered, and uh, I'll cut uh, probably a metre off. I'm not going to need very much, maybe not even a metre, half a metre. It doesn't need to be very long for this. Um, and you can see I've got uh, five, hang on, four, five, six cores here. I think so I've got red green blue which I'll stick you know use for the colors red green blue that makes sense you've got a ground over there black so I'll use that for the ground um, I'll probably join the white up to the ground as well so there's there'll be two connections to the ground there because this has not got shielding it would be better if it was uh, you know had shielding but it's gonna be pretty short like half a meter or a meter or something um, and as I say I'm gonna get a scar cable anyway um, and then yellow we will use for the composite sink so on the Archimedes side, it goes uh, red, green, blue, one, two, three, so pin one's up here. And as I say, it's marked on the actual connector, so we'll just pre-tin these. There we go. All I need to do now is carefully join up uh, the red, green and blue. There we go, that's the red, green and blue, so just the ground and the sink now. So that's the Archimedes end done. I've got some uh, plastic uh, hoods coming for these because I've not got any at the moment. And you can put them on afterwards, that's a good thing with these. Not like uh, dins where you've got to uh, slide the thing on while you, uh, well, before you solder. So we'll just score that around the outside. Yeah, slide that off. You can see we've got those uh, free now. And uh, we'll do the same thing, we'll start with the red, green, and blue. So we'll just pull the red over. It's the same sort of thing. You can just score the end just very carefully there with the snips and then just pull the covering off twist the strands around each other tin it up rinse repeat for the other wires there we go so both could be a bit tidy with some heat shrink and as I say it should be shielded but as you can see it's not very long it's like half a metre if that so uh, I think we'll go and give it a try now oh yes now, before this, it was coming up with just a supervisor prompt. I'll just switch it off and on. We'll just see if we can recreate it. And I think it's because there's no batteries in there to hold the CMOS settings. I'm not sure. 
let's just see what happens, see if it boots, or see if it comes up with a supervisor prompt. It's going to boot, I think. Yeah, that's booting. Uh, you can hear the hard disk um, repeatedly spinning up there like there's a problem with the disk. But the main thing is it's up. So the next challenge I have is I have got a mouse. So I'm going to make an adapter, uh, and it's thanks to Plan C actually. I watched one of his videos oh, a good 12 months ago now, and uh, he just made an adapter from an Amiga mouse to an Archimedes. Now, the main thing with the Archimedes is you've got three buttons. It's described as a quadrature, uh, I think, uh, mouse. It's just the same as any of those other ones with a little uh, rotary encoder thing, you know, it's like a little wheel with slots and it breaks the beam as the spins round, you know, you have one for the x-axis, one for the y. So uh, we'll have a look at that next. So now we've got the display working, I'm going to uh, have a go with this mouse. Now, as you can see, uh, this is one of these switchable ones. It says there, MSAMPCAT. Um, now you'd think that meant <laughs> MS Microsoft, PC as in PC. AT, I'm not sure. The AMAT, I think, is Amiga Atari, actually, because I remember using this on the Amiga. It was severely, severely yellowed when I got this, and I retrobrighted that, and it's, uh, yeah, it's been fine ever since. It looks brand new. Um, so, we need to adapt from that to 9-pin, as you can see here, 9-pin Minidin. That's what the uh, Acorn mouse uses. All nine connections are used, as you can see here. So there's the connector, you've got three pins, four pins and two pins down three uh, rows uh, and as you can see we've got five volts, ground, switch one, two and three, so there's three buttons on an Archimedes mouse and then you've got X reference and X direction, Y reference, Y direction. So that's very similar if you look at the Amiga one here, uh, obviously the pin is completely different but you've got V pulse and then you've got VQ pulse so and then H pulse and HQ pulse so those are the same as the two pairs here your X and Y um, and then you've got button 3 now this is the interesting thing this is for the Amiga so the Amiga natively supports three buttons um, so you, you could I was thinking you could do a mod to this and add a third button maybe stick something on the side or something just a little push switch or something I might consider doing that and I might, uh, well, it's not going to get passed through here, that's the problem with that. Um, but what I was thinking is just having a fly lead coming off with a button, an extra button, and I'll add it into the adapter. So the adapter, as I say, is going to, you know, it'll route button one and button two as normal, so that they work here. I have a button three, like I say, I'll have a wire coming off the adapter with a, a button on it, so I can at least, <laughs> it'll be a bodge, at least I can use the third button though, that's, that's the main thing. Uh, at some point I'll get a proper mouse for this or something, I'm not sure. But I just want something to get me up and running. Uh, so yeah, continuing on, buttons, 5 volts, ground, button. So it should be straightforward to do. I just need to adapt from that to that and have an extra button in there. Now bear in mind, it's only going to be a fudgy adapt to this. I'm going to make it super short, it only needs to be <laughs> literally about that long or something, or even less, you know, sort of like that long, one connector going to another connector, it really needs to be that short. Um, and I've only got six core cable here, again I should be using something shielded, but you know what, for something like this it's going to be fine. Um, so I think what I'll do is cut a piece like that off there, that's going to be the length of the adapter. Because I've only got uh, six cores, I need nine, I'm going to cut the same again, I'm going to strip out three of the wires out of this extra piece and then I'll encapsulate the whole lot with some, some heat shrink. So that will have nine wires. Total fudge. But, uh, you know, yeah, you should expect nothing more <laughs> than fudges from my channel. Just, you know, just quick and easy ways of getting around problems like this. Uh, but you could do a better job. You could get, in fact, I've ordered some. I've ordered some nine core cable, actually, that's shielded. So I could just redo it. But as I say, I'm not going to use all of it. You know, it's not going to be that thick. It's going to be that thick with three of the cores out of here. What I'll do is just, uh, and I'll do this now if I can, I'll just show you, we'll just strip this back. One of my neighbours is going crazy with his sound system. He's actually a DJ. Um, surprisingly, it's a number of doors away and I can hear him. I've got no doubt it's going to be one of those evenings tonight where he's playing music till 3am. I've got a good mind to go around and switch his blooming mains off from the outside of his house. Yeah, yeah. don't do that, we'll end up in a fight or something. So let's uh, just pull three of these out here, as you can see, they come out. 
So yeah, I'm going to need to be mindful of the colours here, but bear in mind that's not going to be hard to do because they're outside here. So I'm not going to get them mixed up while I'm, uh, you know, rooting them. But I'll, like I say, I'll put them like that and I'll put some heat shrink over the lot and encapsulate it all. And it'll look tidy, you'll see. It's, <laughs> it is a bodge, but it'll look tidy. One thing I've found, if you switch this off and on a few times, you can get the hard disk to stay on. So I think the hard disk has just not had enough use in the period of time it's been sat in storage. One of the motors is struggling or something. We can have a look at the hard disk later. I might even, if I, I might just go inside it at some point and have a look. But we, you know, we can replace the caps. There might be some caps and things on there. Some of those old MFM and RLL drives have got resistors that can fail on them as well, actually. Um, but we can look at that later in another video. You can see I've got blue, black, red, white. I've left the uh, this button here because on the this connector here, we don't need that third button. The third button needs to be, you know, the the, the wire I'm going to fly off is going to come off here for the extra button. So there's nothing on the terms of the nine pin connector there. And then I've got yellow, green, and then I thought I'll go with a, a, a sort of common colour standard here. So I've gone yellow, green, outer, yellow, outer, green. So those are the ones that are on the outside. As you can see here, I've got uh, the green and yellow on the outside here. That just means like, so for the horizontal, it's yellow on the pulse and it's uh, on the HQ pulse and it's yellow on the H pulse. So the worst case, I can just swap the yellow ones around and swap the green ones around, forget it around the wrong way. Um, but in theory, that should be okay now. So let's say I've slid my piece of heat shrink. I've got enough wire here to be able to, to deal with this. Um, I need to, oh, where's it gone now? Little connector. Yeah, the problem we will have is this needs to go over the top of the heat shrink here. So I might just cut this down because it doesn't need to be quite that long. Um, I just need to just pull this housing apart here if I can. But yeah, you get the idea. I'll probably cut it back to about here or something so I can slip this on here. And then uh, I might even shrink this here actually in advance so I can just slide it in under there. That might be an idea. Yeah, so I'm going to shrink that now, actually. It's just going to make it a bit easier to assemble, I think. And you can see I've cut it back a bit. It's not quite as long of a heat shrink as it was. But I think that should be okay. Good grief, some serious thought is required to be able to assemble a cable this small. As you can see, I've cut the uh, the end off the thing there, just because you don't need it. This plastic thing's going to be inside there anyway. This is going to be the next challenge, is trying to fit this. Uh, around the thing into the cavity there. I think we can do that. I might have to chop away at the edge of that a little bit. But then it's understanding where this bit goes on. Now it goes, let me think about it, it goes like that, I think. Uh, yeah, it does. It goes that way, there. So this is going to be inside there. And it goes that way around. So you've got to, and it slides down and there's two little notches. You push it, you know, with a tool like this all the way in. So let's just push that back out because you can see that's what it'll look like. Obviously, it'll be right up to the other end. So this bit can go on the last actually, uh, and these plastic bits, uh, there's two of those, can go on the last. So the only thing we need to do now is solder the wires on, slide this thing over, then clip that thing over, uh, and it, like I say, it's going to be tight. It's going to be super tight trying to fit that in. I might just be able to just squeeze them in like that there, and then I should be able to slide the housing up. Uh, and bear in mind I'll have the, the housing for this later that'll just clip on there and hold the two screws. So it's going to be super short, but yeah, hopefully I can pull this off. So that was a f***ing nightmare, if I'm completely honest. The density of the pins there, so, you know, so, so close together, it's near impossible. I had to take this off once already because I had shorts. And as you can see, I cut a piece of heat shrink like that, slid it over there, got it right up to the thing there to isolate the, the, you know, the wires from the edge of here because that was the problem. Uh, right, so now I need to get this on the right way up. So the uh, two on their own there go nearest the edge away from that uh, separator there, actually, I think. Uh, have we got that right way around? Anyway, I slide it on this way. I just need to get it the right way up. So there we go, there's my third mouse button. I can literally just have that somewhere on the table and I can get the middle click. Now, you could argue that because the middle click is used perhaps more than the right click, the best way to wire one of these is to perhaps use uh, you know, the left button and the right button as the left and the middle, if that makes sense. 
I trimmed one of the plastic pieces down here as you can see just to get it to fit and then to pull it out slightly. Um, so yeah, it was a bit crazy having such a short lead here. You know, if you're going to do something like this yourself, go with, I don't know, quarter of a metre, half a metre or something. It just makes it a bit easier. I'm still waiting for the housing for this. I think I might have one somewhere. I might go look for that in a minute. But uh, yeah, let's go plug this in and give it a try. So I'll connect this up. It goes with the two pins at the bottom. Got to be super careful. There we go. That's in. Yeah, you got to be super careful. You can see this is the benefit of having a longer lead because obviously you have more flexibility there. But let's give that a try. Now the interesting thing here is the hard disk started working, and I thought it may do. It was one thing I thought while this was on transit to me actually. A common issue with these old MFM and RLL drives, uh, and even the SD ones to a degree, is when they haven't been used in a long period of time. You find that, that I don't, something happens to the motors. I don't know whether the contacts, um, like commuter, I don't know if they've got commutators or brushes. I'm not sure. They're probably a different type of motor. But nevertheless, the contacts in there kind of get a bit of oxidisation. You can find that these things they'll spin up, you know, and it starts to initialise, then it fails, and it powers back down, and then it spins back up. And if you repeat the cycle a good, you know, few dozen times and leave the thing powered for a little bit, you'll tend to find that after a period of time it starts working and it starts working reliably. Uh, and that is the case with this, it's uh, been tested a few days running now and it's been fine every single time as you can see if I access the hard disk there it's a bit slow but as you can see we can access the hard drive no problems at all so yeah that's a pleasant surprise in the next video I think I'll uh, you know I'll disassemble the thing we're going to need to disassemble it anyway I want to show you some of the internals and things but there is a problem with this there's no sound I've uh, noticed and it's not it's not coming out of the headphone jack either so we do have a fault um, but nevertheless yeah the hard disk is working as you can see the mouse is working and if we were to go over uh, one of these icons here and press the middle button you know, this is our special button here, I can show you this actually. See if I can show you this, move the cursor on the hard disk and I press the middle button, there you go, you've got that. So, yeah, I mean it does mean you need to use both hands while using the mouse, but uh, it's uh, totally workable. Yeah, I shouldn't be using this on the carpet, it's a bit rough. Uh, but, nevertheless, it is working. And if we go into the sound thing, I'll just show you, if we load configure... Uh, sorry, I know we zoomed out a fair way here. So, you've got, uh, where's it gone, the sound there. What's that error? So we've got an error there. The other thing I've noticed, and that could be related to the uh, CMOS actually. Uh, I found when you get these errors like this, where things don't seem to work properly, if you switch it off and on, hold down uh, what is it? Delete. I'll show you in a sec which delete key. Power it back up. I just watch the colour. Watch it kind of go reddish, I think. There we go. That shows you initialising the CMOS settings. We we'll probably need to add the hard disk again as a setting once it boots. Because it probably won't pick it up as default now we've cleared it, I think. I'm not sure. Let's see. Yeah, see, it's not showing the hard disk now. But if we go to apps again, uh, we'll just try that again. I'll just show you the sound thing. Hopefully, it shouldn't error. Maybe there is something wrong with the sound hardware. Yeah, you see, look, that was error. That was error before. No, it's not. Um, yeah, so that's one aspect to that. But trust me, there's still no sound despite having done that. The disks thing, you've got to go into here and then you, where it says ST506 hard disk, you just click the up to add one. Uh, click OK, click OK. And that hopefully should go away and add it. There we go, the icon down there. Let's close that, close that. And as you can see, that's working. In fact, that came up quick in here. So yeah, uh, I do need to uh, do something with the CMOS side of things on here. It's perhaps lacking a battery. So, the next thing to show you, uh, I've got a copy of uh, Elite here, so I'll put that in. Now, there were two discs that said Elite that came with this, and uh, one of them didn't read, it just wouldn't work at all. You can hear that's reading the drive okay. It's a bit slow, but there we go. And if we double click on Elite, wait for it to appear down here. Yeah, that's loaded, and click the icon. Copy protection, just press return. As you can see, that's working, but there's no sound, as I say, and I've tested with headphones as well. There's just nothing. So I think we've got a fault there. We'll have a look at that in the next video. But the next thing was to try and get some other software on here, uh, and I'll show you the process in a second. If I just take that disc out, we'll do a reset. There's a little reset button on the keyboard. I should reset it. Um, 
this copy of Elite it wasn't working, it was corrupted completely. So I thought, well, I'll use this disc. So I'll show you on a, uh, an old PC that's got a floppy drive, um, not a USB floppy drive, and it's got to be an oldish PC that's got the old, the original sort of uh, floppy interface there. I'm using my old uh, Pentium 2. Um, and there's some software called Omniflop, and you can, uh, you know, the, the ADF images for this, you know, the disk uh, archive images, if you like, you know, this, the equivalent of ISOs, you know, for Acorn discs. But ADF um, is the extension you'll see on those for use with emulators and stuff. You can write those using Omniflop um, to a floppy. And I've just done that with this one. If I stick this in, this has now got uh, Pac Mania on. If I just go to the floppy drive should see, there we go, Pat Mania. Now, I've run this a minute ago from the disc and it works fine, but I thought, why, while we're here, why not stick it on the hard disc? Um, and I can show you something else. These usually ship with a 20 gig, uh, sorry, 20 meg, not, not gig, 20 megabytes, <laughs> that's it, 20 megabyte hard disc. So if I uh, just, oh, sorry, cat's walking in the way. If I just press the middle button on the hard disc down, we choose free, you can see there, free 17 megabytes. Sorry, that might be a bit far away, that. Yeah, you can see 17 megabytes free used, 22 megabytes size, 40 megabytes. So I'm pleasantly surprised it's got a 40 megabyte hard disk, not the standard 20. Um, the other thing we can do, because I was a bit concerned, is, is you know, it, it, on the front it says 440 slash 1. I thought, have I been conned here? Because it's been described as a 440 slash 4. And if we uh, middle click on the, the acorn icon down there and do info, hang on, let's do that again. Info, there we go. We can see uh, it's 3.10, sorry that's not what I was looking for, I was looking for the RAM. I think you just click on here, yeah you do, you just click on the Acorn icon. And you can see up here, uh, next 640k, free, 3 meg. And if we scroll right down to the bottom we've got total 4096 there. So yeah, it is the 4 meg version, that's nice. Um, but yeah, coming back to what I was saying, why not uh, create a folder on the hard disk and copy that game across. Now let's just try copying just that icon across to here. Struggling to read the back of that disc there, isn't it? I might have to write that disc again. It was a bad disc. I guess that gives me the opportunity to show you how you do it with Omniflop here. So we choose to write a disc next, floppy disk A. And as part of the installation for this, you um, install a floppy driver and a floppy controller driver that replace the ones in Windows. I'm just using Windows 2000 here, but I think it works with 95 and 98. So you can see we've got the, uh, uh, what I've done here is rename the ADF to .adl. That's what you've got to do, uh, and then choose double-sided interleaved uh, finish. It tells you you've got to use a double density disk, not HD disk, and then it goes away and starts to write it. So that'll take a minute or two, but when that's done, I'll try and copy it across again to see if it works. Might need to try another disk because obviously there is an issue with this particular floppy. So we'll try that copy again. I'll delete the version from the uh, hard disk here if I can. How do you do it? App delete. So it's gone from the hard disk and we'll just drag it across again. I suspect it's going to be lacking the battery. Um, I hope it's not corroded everywhere. I mean, that's a possibility. But yeah, as you can see, that's now on the hard disk. And if we double tap that or remove the floppy, yeah, that's much quicker. Much, much, much quicker. Fantastic. Sweet. And the reset button, by the way, is here. And if I press that now, you can see it does reset the system. But the keyboard does need some work, actually, because some of the keys are not working. I'll try and show you that. So if I load edit, uh, let's just click that. Yeah, so we've got an edit window. I'll zoom you in. And if I press the keys, though, so we've got Q, W, W, look, so W's not working. E, R, T, Y, U, I, O, O's not, yeah. Oh, was not working earlier, but after a few taps, that seems to work now. P, A, S, D, D's not working. F, G, H, J's not working. K, 
L. Yeah, some of the characters there are not working, symbols and things. So yeah, I'm going to strip the keyboard down next, I think. So to get in the keyboard, it looks like we've got screws all around the edges here. We'll get those out. And then presumably, yeah, that just lifts off. So uh, yeah, that's interesting actually, just looking at this. I didn't expect this at all, the PCB to look uh, this way. Um, anyway, there's going to be loads of little screws here you can see we're going to need to remove next. Uh, and I'll do this carefully because I'm not sure how the keys actually work here. It may well be they've got those little rubber plungers under each one. And if you're not careful, they can just fly out everywhere. So that's all the screws out. So very carefully lift this up. And yeah, we've got, oh, you can't see here. We've got a ground connection just down here. I'll just move across, can you see that? So I'll just carefully slide that off. There we go, so we can move that out of the way. So you can see the problem here. These just need cleaned up, obviously got lots of dust and fluff and stuff. But we clean the uh, PCB up there with some IPA and cotton buds. I'll do that in a second. Uh, and this is super interesting. I've never seen a keyboard like that before, actually. Can you see that little silver contacts there? So again, you know, you can see bits of fluff and dust and stuff. Um, uh, yeah, my first thought was to vacuum that, but you might end up sucking all the little silver bits off. I'm not sure whether they're just sat on there, whether they're attached to anything or what. Presumably they're stuck to the underneath of the key. Yeah, I think they are. So, yeah, you could probably uh, gently vacuum over that, I would I suspect, but, yeah, not with the vacuum too powerful. And then clean over them with IPA and cotton buds, and we'll do that in a sec. Um, note, there is one missing there, but that's correct, that key is quite a wide key, it's a bit like they did on the Atari ST where they realised they only needed, they needed one. The design was perhaps to have a bit of redundancy there, you know, to make the connection a bit more reliable, but ultimately for manufacturing they decided it wasn't worth the extra cost of fitting the extra thing there. So we'll do the plungers first, uh, I'm just going to test this with IPA, yeah it should be alright I think. Uh, and just gently wipe them and then use the dry end. The hardest thing with something like this is keeping track of which ones you've done, you know, put your finger somewhere so you know where you start and then just work your way methodically uh, across the columns and rows here. I should have started in the bottom corner really, it would have made more sense. And you can see the fluff that came off there, it's left a bit of a mess. You know, we've got some uh, corrosion actually there. So I'm going to go over that with the fiberglass pen actually. The other thing I might just do is just gently wipe over that with some deoxit. And then I'll inspect it just to make sure I've not got any broken connections there. I've inspected that quite closely and it's okay, it's just dark grey. Uh, there is still a sufficient amount of solder there, so that's okay. So if I zoom out a little bit, and uh, well, I'll zoom you in on one of the bits of dirt or something down here. We just need to go over with a cotton bud and some IPA, and again, we might need to use the fiberglass pen. Can you see that's not coming off there? Um, or we could use deoxit. Um, I don't think these are silver plated or anything. I don't know, they're coated with something, aren't they? Nickel or something, so you, you've got to be careful. Yeah, some of this here is corrosion. I don't know if you can see, it's like some corroded traces, so I'm going to need to scratch the surface off somewhere on here, I think, and uh, fix that trace. I can just use, because this is, uh, you know, little traces here, I can easily solder a piece of coil wire there and then, you know, stretch it across, solder it on the other side. So it's pretty easy to fix these, but I think in the most part, the reason these aren't working, just tilt your cross a bit here, you know, back to this one, it's these bits of contamination. They're going to need scratching off, you're going to have to use or I'm going to have to use the fiberglass pen there on those little bits to try and uh, remove them. Otherwise, the um, little silver plate, you know, when it, it makes contact, it's not going to make a nice, reliable connection. Yeah, so one thing I would say is they're pretty hardy, these. A lot of the connections have uh, gone over here. There's, you know, there are a few places where there's bits of corrosion. I've cleaned the corrosion off and then checked connectivity, and the connectivity is perfect. So um, I think we should be okay. As you can see, to speed things up, I'm just going over here with the uh, paper towel now. Uh, and again, I'll just revisit any of these that have got, uh, you know, still got a little bit of what looks like corrosion on there with the fiberglass pen. 
So we'll connect this back up. I need to connect that ground first. I'll have to do that off camera and then just uh, you know sit it over there, put the screws back on. I'm going to vac the other side of the keyboard at that point just to make sure I've got all the bits of fluff and dust out. I should have done that first really, but yeah, we'll do that second. So I might strip this down and clean these keys individually at some point, but uh, just for now, I'm just going to go over with soap and water and stuff, you know, you can see the dirt coming off there. Yeah, I can still see a few marks on the keyboard, I've got most of the marks off there. As you can see, it's looking a lot better. There's still an awful lot of dirt on the keyboard there. Um, what you can do is, you know, when we disassembled it before, there were some screws holding the actual key, key assembly into the plastic shell. So you can just remove the screws there and then this plastic piece can come off and you can get to the keycaps a little bit easier as well. Um, I could just pull them all off and stick them in the sink and oxy-action them. But just I just wanted to do something quick, just quickly clean this up so that I can move on to other things and we can perhaps revisit the keyboard. And so I've got the keyboard all connected up again. Let's go back into uh, edit again. Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P Bracket, bracket, backslash, return. Yeah, it's working fine now, I think. Yeah, those weren't working either before. We had a bunch of symbol keys and things that just not, you know, not doing anything. Yeah, sweet. Let's just test the number pad. Yep. They call that a success. That's an unlock. Yeah, brilliant. The main thing is it's working now. We've got video. And we've got a mouse. Uh, and as I said earlier, perhaps the best way of doing something like this, I could have modified this mouse and added another button somewhere. You know, I could have maybe cut a piece out of here and stuck a button there, or stuck a button on the side or something, you know, uh, for the third mouse click. But uh, yeah, it just means that I've not interfered with the mouse, I've not altered the, uh, the arc in any kind of way, I've just got an adapter that I can use and I can gain that third button. So in the next video we'll clean up the floppy drive, uh, have a look at the motherboard, obviously we need to get the sound working because this is lacking sound at the moment. Maybe have a look at the power supply, clean up and stuff in general around the case and the board. Um, and maybe share one or two of the games and things. I do hope you found the video interesting, please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.